Hello, my name is Dave Barker, and I'm going to be reading to you from this book. This is Snakes and Snake Hunting, written in 1957 by Carl Caulfield. Carl Caulfield was a famous herpetological curator at the Staten Island Zoo, and he put together the biggest rattlesnake collection ever in history up to that time. Um, he, this book is a landmark book. It inspired snake keepers from 1957 to the present to become snake collectors, snake hunters, to look for snakes in nature, see where snakes lived. Caulfield really popularized that in a way that had never been done previously. So, beginning at the beginning, some of my serious-minded colleagues may think it frivolous of me to chronicle my snake hunting experiences, but it is a common failing of old hunters that they love to recount their former exploits on any pretext whatsoever. Such an inclination is only natural, for in this way they recapture the precious moments of their triumphs. The curtain of time rolls back, and old scenes and campsites become fresh again in the memory. I invite you to relive with me the scenes of the chase in the southern swamps, in western mountains and deserts, to smell the aromatic smoke from a campfire burning live oak branches, pine cones, and Spanish moss to watch a Carolina moon come up through moss-draped oaks, to sniff the fragrance of a swamp magnolia in the Jersey Barrens, and to explore a swamp of white cedar, and finally, to share with me the excitement and the thrill that is ours when we come upon our unusual game after hours and even days of dogged search, the rattler coiled in the trail, or the rat snake resting on a tree branch limb, the old hunter is prone to pull the longbow, but however entertaining these tales may be, there has been no embellishment whatsoever. There is some suspense, there's much, much frustration, and often an ironical twist, all of which are considered good elements in fiction. But this is not fiction. I have been as truthful as field notes and cherished memories of these events permit. And there are some observations not recorded elsewhere, which might suggest subjects for serious study by students of herpetology. Besides the satisfaction there is for me in relating these episodes of my field trips, it could help to dispel some of the misconceptions and fears harbored by most people where snakes are concerned. There are also some useful hints for those who have recently acquired a taste for snake hunting, that growing group of snake fanciers and young herpetologists. Some of the old timers may enjoy drawing comparisons with their own experiences and perhaps be led to record the highlights of their own days afield. I do not feel that my snake hunting stories, unlike the tales of olden times, have to have a moral. But I believe they would justify being told if they help to develop a more healthy attitude in amateur herpetologists. If I can show that the pursuit can be an end in itself, that catching and placing the snake under restraint is often an anticlimax that brings little satisfaction, only oft neglected responsibilities then will I feel that these tales have served a worthy purpose. Chapter 1. The Natural History of the Hunter and the Hunted The urge to hunt and collect is strong in most of us, but never stronger in any one group of people than in naturalists, the zoologists and the botanists. However much they may be immersed in fascinating details of a research problem, None hesitates to cover his microscope, close the specimen jars, and place the study skins back on the shelf, or whatever. Gather up collecting paraphernalia and take off to any region that time permits. Sometimes this might be for six months or a year, sometimes for only a long weekend. 
all of us have the same enthusiasm for field work, the anticipation of seeing the plants and the creatures in their natural state, whether this is only a few miles from home during our day off or thousands of miles away on the other side of the globe. Usually the more remote, the better. The attraction of the strange and the unknown is undeniable, but there are many thrills to be had close at hand. The collecting of specimens is often the primary purpose of such excursions, whether in the line of duty by the professional naturalist or merely, merely for recreation, merely for recreation, but even more important to the individual collector is the opportunity to get out of doors. As Washington Irving said, any change is welcome even if it's from bad to worse. And in some instances, it may be just that, the discomforts, not to say any dangers, that some hunters will endure without a murmur are sometimes incredible. But I think that even more powerful reason is the strong desire within all proper naturalists to see the creatures which interest them in the wild state. A preserved specimen in a study collection has its undeniable value, and the same may be true of the living specimens in the cages of a zoo, but there is no specimen like the one that we come upon ourselves in its own environment, in its natural setting of plants and other animals that complete the picture of the habitat niche. This is the sight that makes the hunter's heart beat faster, the thrill that hardly has an equal. Many times I have been reluctant to catch a much sought after snake or lizard, feeling that to remove it from its home would be a sacrilege, like cutting an individual tree from a Corot painting. Finding the creature is enough. This is often a most difficult achievement in itself. Why carry it further? However, if there is justification for collecting the specimen once it has been found, we should do so. But we must be certain that our responsibility is fulfilled afterwards, whether it be as a contribution to a study collection in some museum, a cage in a zoo, or even as a pet in our own home, provided we care for it adequately. The bird observers have evolved the best practice and philosophy. Instead of shooting down their quarry with shotguns, as was done by all ornithologists in earlier times, collecting is now practiced only when the specimens are required. It is true that the restraint of the bird people has been more or less imposed upon them by the restrictions of conservation laws. They have nevertheless been able to gain the greatest satisfaction from merely finding and observing the bird afield. Despite this elimination of a tangible souvenir of the chase, the ornithologists number more amateur enthusiasts in their group than any other natural history pursuit. If there are those among my readers who doubt anything noteworthy can happen to a zoological collector in our own country, let me remind them that we still boast a good portion of the Earth's wild areas, and that we possess one of the richest snake faunas anywhere in the world. All of my narratives are of expeditions within the continental United States. The tropics have no monopoly of snakes. There are few, if any, places, even in the snakiest equatorial regions, where one can see a hundred snakes in one night, mostly venomous, as one can in Florida, or see as many as 20 or 25 rattlesnakes in one day, as can be done in New York or Pennsylvania. And speaking of rattlesnakes, let me inform my non-herpetological readers that rattlesnakes are universally conceded to be among the world's most impressive beasts. And if we be permitted to verge on the sensational, our own, our very own diamondback rattlesnakes are among the world's first four and most deadly snakes. The King Cobra, the Bushmaster, and the Fair de Lance are its only rivals. In addition, personal collecting in the tropics is reduced to a minimum, 
Professional museum and zoo collectors are often forced to employ natives to gather their specimens. The collectors set up clearing stations for receiving and housing the catch, which is brought to them. Usually the details of this tremendous task make it almost impossible for them to go out and about much themselves, looking for special creatures or enjoying the charms of their surroundings. Only the permanent resident has the time to hunt without native help. We are the permanent residents of the United States, and to a herpetologist in India, a rattlesnake is every bit as exotic as a cobra is to us. I have been chided many times from being overly preoccupied with rattlesnakes, and it must be confessed that the hero, or the villain, if you insist, of the following adventures is often a rattlesnake. It is not an attempt to be sensational. Rattlesnakes have the same appeal for me that the hawks and owls have among the birds, that the cat animals have among the mammals. They are magnificent. They are splendid creations ingeniously constructed after eons of gradual change like predators everywhere, especially where they represent a hazard to human life. They are persecuted, most often unjustly and stupidly, because they are feared. As with so many animals, closer study often reveals the popular notion to be completely at odds with the truth. If I can show my readers rattlesnakes as I find them to be, not in my snake cages at the Staten Island Zoo, but as they are on their own native heath, then I will have served another worthy end. If they are expecting to hear any gruesome tales of attacks by rattlesnakes, readers will be disappointed. I have seen literally hundreds of rattlesnakes in the field. I have been attacked by a snake exactly once in 30 years of hunting snakes not by a rattlesnake, but by a harmless black snake. You will find nothing sensational here. Interesting, I hope, perhaps even at times thrilling. Occasionally there have been moments of peril, but not from snakes, more likely from foolishly, foolishly climbing out on some precipitous rock nose, or from a careless or stupid act on the part of one of us in the party, possibly the greatest dangers are encountered, encountered in traveling from place to place by automobiles. It has been said that no well-run expedition has adventures. Adventures reflect inefficiency. And again, that the most dangerous animal in the woods is man, especially if the man has a gun. Because my companions and I in the field always seek to catch our game alive, we never carry guns and so suffer no peril in that regard. The equipment of the snake hunter is simple. It consists of several cloth bags of varying sizes in which to carry the catch, preferably fairly heavy material, but not canvas. And a hook, sometimes two hooks, these hooks vary in design according to the fancy of the hunter. One may be a simple angle iron attached by one side to a four-foot wooden handle of whatever weight and quality desired. I have found that a certain type of grass whip, when the blade is removed, makes an ideal snake hook. Although these instruments are essential for catching and pinning venomous snakes, their primary use is rooting through vegetable debris, turning logs and planks, poking into holes, and virtually every task which ordinarily could be done with the hands. It is axiomatic in snake hunting that one never places the hand anywhere that doesn't afford complete visibility. I hardly need point out that only a fool puts his hand in a hole when hunting in a locality where poisonous snakes are known to occur. Certain devices have been constructed that act as clamps, much on the same principle as the instrument employed by a grocer for lifting cans from a high shelf. These are especially convenient, almost indispensable, when collecting venomous snakes in rocky terrain where they are inclined to retreat into crevices and holes. 
A quick grab with a clamp stick often succeeds in catching a snake which otherwise would be irretrievably lost. Essentially, their construction consists of a movable jaw or a prong closing on a stationary jaw or prong affixed to the end of the main stem of the instrument. These jaws are covered with rubber tubing to prevent injury to the snake. The movable portion is operated by a wire attached to, the, to a squeeze mechanism in the handle, functioning identically like an old type automobile set brake handle. Non-poisonous snakes are seized by hand, regardless of how much they might bite or resent their capture in other ways. The use of a noose device is not recommended, except in most unusual circumstances. Such circumstances are described in the story about water snakes. A noose will often injure the snake so severely that it is useless as a healthy living specimen. Removal of a poisonous snake from a noose, once it has been captured, can be a highly hazardous procedure. So that the hunter, as well as this, or for the hunter, as well as to the snake. Most snakes struggle so fiercely to free themselves that they break their necks or they suffer friction burns which can result in festering sores and are referred to as noose burns. On the whole, the noose is to be condemned. Better the specimen should escape than be mutilated irreparably. Additional equipment depends on the needs and the preferences of the individual hunter. Most of us stuff some tin cans in our pockets for some small forms of any kind, perhaps a lizard or an interesting insect that we know some entomologist friend would like to have. It might be prudent to include a first aid kit for the treatment of snake bite. Every snake hunter is quite convinced that it's not going to happen to him, and oddly enough, it rarely does, but it's wise to be prepared. And now the reader has been made acquainted with the very barest essentials of the snake hunter's philosophy, procedure, and equipment the necessary groundwork for a proper understanding of the incidents about to be related. But before we start out on our first hunt, I must emphasize again for the sake of those who still harbor the impression that snakes are vicious creatures attacking any intruder into their domain. That is most emphatically not so. This misconception, probably fathered by sensational literature, is one that I have found to be almost universal among laymen. Most definitely, attack is as foreign to snake nature as it is to most wild creatures. They seek only to remain unmolested. Most will remain lying where they are encountered, but more often they will beat a very hurried retreat or promptly vanish into a nearby hole. Poisonous snakes were endowed with venom by nature for the express purpose of securing their food, which always consists of small mammals ranging roughly from mouse to rabbit in size. Without its poison, the venomous snake would be helpless to obtain a meal. As a means of defense, poison is of little value against larger animals and the snake is reluctant to employ this method if it can at all be avoided. Naturally, too close encroachment on the snake or an attempt to catch and pick it up will inevitably arouse its resentment and the strike and the bite are defensive measures which the snake hunter trains himself to avoid. He also trains himself to be observant, to move slowly, quietly, deliberately, noting every detail of his immediate surroundings. It is an everlasting disgrace to overlook a snake that might be so close as to inflict a bite. The snake you see is not dangerous. It is the snake you don't see that might cause trouble by retaliating for an injury that you inadvertently inflict. To find the snake is the challenge. To get out into wilderness, to enjoy all the beauties of nature, and finally, with good fortune, to discover the creature 
sought in its natural haunts, this is the reward. And the final satisfaction granted the snake man, but denied the bird man, is that he can hold his trophy in his hand, even if only to release it a moment later. The end of the chapter. Thank you for listening.